You are seeing the President of the United States. Look at the lines. You join our movement. A lot of uh, President Trump supporters here. Greatest movement in the history of our country. I think that our country is going to be stronger than ever before. I think that next year is going to be a tremendous success. I feel that if the Democrats get in, we are literally going to end up in a recession slash depression, the likes of which you've never seen. But the defund the police idea, I, I cannot for the life of me grasp. Uh, you know, I've already mentioned it. Time, it's for real. Now to the race of the White House, and after decades of very publicly flirting with the idea, Billionaire Donald Trump says he really is running for president this time around. Donald Trump is running for president. This phrase is not from any movie I nor my colleagues can remember. Do your own research. Don't take my word for it. Look it up yourself and you will find the truth behind what Joe Biden has not done for the art community and the truth as to what Donald Trump has done for our community. We're talking about basement Biden, right? Uh, what is his agenda? Has he really even told us what his agenda is? Remember, this Congress started off with the Democrats saying we should abolish ICE. It then moved to we should abolish the entire Department of Homeland Security. We have to go to the polls on November 3rd, and the rest, you know what to do. You know what to do. We are one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. America great again. Welcome to Team Trump Online. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Faith in America, Evangelicals for Trump. My name is John Pence, Senior Advisor to President Trump's campaign, and I am joined by a wonderful group of faith leaders from our Evangelical for Trump Coalition. Joining us tonight is Pastor Paula White, spiritual advisor to President Trump, Reverend Johnny Moore, one of America's most influential evangelical leaders and a leading advocate for persecuted Christians around the world, and Pastor Samuel Rodriguez, president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's so great to be talking about the importance of faith in America. Absolutely. Thanks for having now, us. Thank you for having us. Thank you all. And to begin, Pastor White, could you please offer uh, a prayer for our nation and, and, and our president? I would absolutely love to. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. We know that we can enter in boldly by the blood of Jesus, the finished work. First and foremost, we pray over our president, a hedge of protection, a wall of fire around him. We ask that you give him wisdom according to James 1, 5, that you lead him by your spirit, that you surround him with godly counsel. And Lord, we right now secure his purpose. We secure his destiny. And we thank you that you continue to use him to lead our nation to go through these times, these difficult times, these trying times, and that we would truly stay secure to you. We would lift up you right now. We declare that no weapon formed against him will be able to prosper. And we thank you that tonight will be a night that's been ordained by you, that you will anoint us to be uh, uh, vessels for your use as the oracles of the Most High God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Now, to begin our discussion, I want to talk about the importance of protecting places of worship. Mm -hmm. You know, our nation turns to faith in good times and bad, and this is our shared American creed. Um, it, it seems like right now what Joe, Joe Biden, the media, and radical left often overlook is that faith unites America. Mm -hmm. Let's not cancel out the fact that our great civil rights leader of our country Dr. Martin Luther King was first a minister of Christ. But today's radical left on Twitter and elsewhere are now leading the charge to destroy um, d statues of, of our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, and attempted to burn churches throughout our nation. Um, 
staining and hurting what makes America great, um, the church. I, I want to get your opinion on these on these vile calls to, quote, uh, destroy all murals and stained glass windows uh, across America and tear down statues of Jesus Christ. And maybe we can start, Johnny, with your with your thoughts on what's happening. Well, I, I'll tell you, the, the president couldn't have said it any better than himself uh, this weekend when he when he said that Joe Biden and the Democrats want to prosecute people for going to church, but they don't want to prosecute people for burning down a church. I mean, I, you know, like, like lots of people, I watch the speeches, I listen to, you know, from beginning to end, but that line when he was in Tulsa, I mean, it really sat on me because, because that's what we're seeing, you know, and, and here's the crazy thing, guys, like, you know, the, the, the Democrats are always using this phrase. They say silence is complicity, right? That, that's their phrase. Every time anything happens, you know, if, if you're silent, you're complicit. And yet, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, we have someone running for president of the United States, Joe Biden, who hasn't said a word about any of this. You know, it, it, it was amazing to me as, as we watched in horror the, the fire in, in, the, in the basement of St. John's Church. We watched St. John's Church be vandalized just a few days ago. Like, like wh where is, where, where's the outrage? Like, where is it? You know, and it, and it tells us something. I mean, it tells us either, either you know, Joe Biden actually believes this stuff. He actually supports defunding the police and not protecting our houses of worship and and tearing down our history. I mean, he, not only has he not only has he been silent on burning churches for goodness sakes, he hasn't said a word about you know the abolitionists, their statues that have been torn down, right? Or or there was a threat against a statue of Abraham Lincoln earlier this week. Totally silent. So either he believes this stuff or he's too weak and cowardly to stand up to it. And I don't care which one it is. It's pretty terrifying, actually, because because the fact of the matter is the the moderate Democratic Party, its leadership is gone. OK, it's just gone. The, yeah. the, the party, the strings of the party are being pulled by these progressive activists. And, I, and I, I'm telling you, if he becomes president of the, of the United States, those same strings are going to be pulling and we're going to there will be no moderate Democratic Party to speak about what we're seeing in our streets, the threats we're seeing against religious communities, the willingness to shut down churches in this in this pandemic while letting everything else you know happen. This is going to become not irregular. This is going to going to become the norm. The gift Joe Biden is giving us, though, actually, is as long as he stays hiding from all of this, you know, the, the, the secret part is coming out for all of us to hear and to see every day. Absolutely. And, and Pastor Rodriguez, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on now uh, the Democrats first coming for our history books, now coming for faith? Yeah, they're coming after faith. Now, here's the issue. Somewhere down the road, uh, they're going to have to cross the proverbial Jordan of recognizing that their leading demographics, the constituencies that they depend on for power are constituencies of faith. Latinos and African Americans love Jesus. So the, the, the Democratic Party right now is experiencing a moment of Zen. This is their epiphany. They're exposing the true color of the radical left fringe group taking over, burning down churches, the statues. Not only that, are you, I mean, we're privy to the fact that this, this movement out there is demanding that people kneel, that they kneel to a movement. The only one that's going to get me to kneel is Jesus. I'm going to bow before the presence of Christ and Christ alone. So you're burning down churches. You're bringing down the statue of Jesus. It's an anti-Christian element hijacking the Democratic Party. So now the donkey is really looking far away from the lamb and getting further and further away from the lamb. This is not the Democratic Party of 2008 or 2000 or 1992. This is not that party. This is not the party that met with evangelical leaders in 2007 and affirmed the evangelical credo. It's not that party. It's hostile to our Christian worldview in every sense of the word. And Johnny is correct. The silence of Joe Biden, that silence right now makes him complicit. De facto affirming the actions that run against our Judeo-Christian value system. Mm -hmm. Pastor White, you're a spiritual advisor to our great president. You know his heart. Um, why, why is the president so concerned that there are those radical left calling to 
destroy and attack places of faith in the United States? Well, for a plethora of reasons. Number one, it's very personal to him, and you see that in his policy. He has been such a freedom fighter for faith and for freedom religions and for the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, everything that is so dear to us. Look, while there has been a lot of silence on Biden, there's also been a lot of vocal. The Democratic Party decided not to talk about God, not even this time, but last election. This time within the resolution in August, they said, we are the party of godless. That it, it, They will not insert God into this. We can basically kiss our churches goodbye, our houses of worship, and say, you know, we very well could be home churches at that. When we look at something like our Chief Justice Roberts, and nobody's talking about this or saying this except for President Trump, when he made a ruling at 10 minutes at midnight, there was supposed to be an emergency ruling that ruled with California where we have a governor that, Sammy, you're there, you're fighting that, you were willing to be arrested, you were willing to be fined, you were willing to go out on the road for to take what you had to take for your religious freedoms. They ruled with the Ninth Circuit that then government could say, we can limit gatherings. Now we see protests, we see people getting out, we see masses of thousands doing everything, but we can't worship. We already knew about Mississippi and the fining. We knew about uh, Minnesota. We knew about Kentucky. We knew about all these. But in California, when he ruled with that, well, we would say, you'd go, well, that was emergency. That was not merit, meaning that was not precedent. But now we have of Chicago in the Seventh Circuit with Easterbrook trying to say that is precedent. Why is that so important? Because President Trump or whoever gets in, we're not just fighting for four years. We're fighting a 30 year. Whoever goes in is going to put in a minimum of two Supreme Court justices. We know these things are going to get litigated. When they get litigated, will they rule now over on a liberal side? that will set precedent that says we as government can tell you how to worship, when to worship, how big you can worship, with who you can worship, and, and within those contexts, or will we have constitutionalists and originalists who hold us to the documents which outside of the Bible are the greatest documents that are ever written and hold us to the truth of the Constitution that say we have the right of speech, we have the right to worship. We are in a really critical moment and we must wake up and see how this applies to our everyday life because what else are they going to do? They're censoring already. Johnny can tell you this. We're all fighting censoring on our Facebook, on our social medias, on what we say, on, on so many things. So the houses of worship, I can guarantee you one thing. President Trump always says, we worship God, not government. I had a deep conversation with Dr. Ben Carson. He said, Paula, we have real enemies. Now we know that Ephesians 6, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, wickedness, and darkness. Those spirits use people. I always say even good people can be used by bad spirits. But in this situation, when we look at this, we said, you know, this is no longer just Democrat versus Republican, black and white. He he said, we are fighting for the, for the freedom of our country not to become socialism, Marxism. And we've got to identify there are real enemies to America. And what they will hit the hardest is what our forefathers wanted to make sure that was our absolute right. And that was the right to worship. So true. Um, well, we have lots more to talk about tonight. Stay with us. More on Faith in America, Evangelicals for Trump. We'll be right back. In 2016, we built an unbeatable operation that changed history. Now, we unveil our next breakthrough. The exclusive Trump 2020 app. This, this isn't just an app. This is your source for real news, not fake news. Straight from the campaign and the president himself. This is your direct line to give input on key campaign issues. Your portal to register voters. Host MAGA meetups, your scheduler, your application on becoming a Trump team leader. Join millions and get a front row seat to our virtual events. Watch Team Trump every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Earn points, get rewarded. Get the presidential photo. Oh, and did we mention it? This is your personal shopper too? So just to repeat, this isn't just an app. This is your tool to keep America great. Join the army for Trump and download the app today. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Faith in America, Evangelicals for Trump by such a great panel. We just talked about the importance of protecting places of worship and faith in America. Let's talk about religious freedom and why this president supports religious freedom at home and abroad. Johnny, you are such an advocate for religious freedom abroad and protecting Christians in every corner of the world. Tell us how this president supports religious freedom in those efforts. Well, I, I can tell you, like, President Trump is, the only way I know how to put it is he's like the Abraham Lincoln for religious freedom in, in the United States history. There has never been a president that prioritized religious freedom in, in the way President Trump has. I mean, you you take it in foreign policy. I mean, he's he is... Uh, do you think of Iran, China, North Korea, you know, the worst violators of religious freedom around the world, Cuba, the, the president's policy has been unequivocal. I mean, he is, he's, he's crushed Iran. Uh, he's, he's sanctioned uh, the regional leaders responsible for the, for the persecution of people yeah. all around the world. He's contained uh, the, the, the ambitions of, of, uh, of, not only the Iranians, you know, internally, but their external ambitions outside of the United States. He destroyed ISIS. I mean, North Korea. You know, we're now in a, a totally different situation with North Korea. We're, we're we we were worried about a war. You know, the president's foreign policy has worked with North Korea. You know, and and then on the positive side, you know, it's not it's not just the negative side of of dealing with the chief persecutors of Christians in the world, countries like Iran. You know, on the positive side, I mean, we're seeing a, a, a moment in, in history where the peer pressure is moving in the right direction, where we're having active conversations mm -hmm. throughout the Gulf and the broader Islamic world about the promotion of, of religious freedom around the world. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, the, the president signed an executive order which yeah. um, prioritized religious freedom in our American foreign policy, gave our State Department more tools to, to enforce it. This is after, by the way. Uh, he's had two ministerials on religious freedom, which were the largest human rights event ever in the United States history. I mean, every way you look at it, religious freedom hasn't been part of the foreign policy of President Trump. It's been at the very heart of it. I mean, it, it is the very, very heart of our of our foreign policy. Mm. And uh, and I can mm. tell you, in the previous administration, in the Obama-Biden administration, I, I was working every single day just to try to get somebody to care about the Christians that were being killed by ISIS. And, and I can tell you, I was having meetings in Washington, D.C., where you know a, a few people would sneak out of the Obama-Biden White House because their conscience was so burdened by what was going on, and they just couldn't explain you know, the, the, the foreign policy. I mean, it was, it was crazy. They, they fought against a genocide resolution against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Uh, it, it, the, the first uh, five years of the Obama-Biden administration, they wouldn't, they wouldn't recognize Boko Haram as a terrorist organization. Right. They refused to recognize them as a terrorist organization. Like every way, every way you look at it, you know, I, I, there's so many things. Like I, I could just go on and on and on and on. I mean, the, the, the president's record on religious freedom, unparalleled, cannot be compared. The world is safer. The bad guys are weaker. Our First Amendment is, is prioritized. But it begins here. You know, and, and, and Paula can talk about that a, a little bit, uh, but, but let me just make, let me make one point. What we saw in COVID-19 was we saw the evangelical community be willing to comply with everything the government asked us to do, everything the government asked us to do. We disseminated information, we saved lives, we shut down our church service, certain church services for a period of time. But what did democratic governors do as soon as we did that? They took advantage of it. And in, and in California, I mean, it might still be the case now, but like a week ago, you still couldn't have more than 100 people in a church service, according to the, to the law in most parts of the state. Thousands of people out in the streets with no social distancing whatsoever. I mean, this shows us what they intend on doing. They, they just want to take the First Amendment and just like strike a little line to it or deprioritize it. And my work around the world tells me something. It says that, that, that what 
has happened in other countries can happen here. That's why you have to tie the two together, what's happening overseas and then domestic religious freedom too. And there's so many more things, Shani, even as we talk like around the world, how he brought uh, Pastor Andrew Brunson back from Turkey immediately, mm -hmm. what he did on the lives of so many. Um, uh, there are so many different families that we could continue to talk about internationally, as he said. And with that EO that was just signed, it's not just an EO to give greater protection, but he also puts money there. People don't realize eight and yep. ten or, or, or persecuted because of their faith. This is people of all faith. There was over $50 million immediately released, helping work with the NSC. There were so many. Now bring it home domestically. I mean, you look at things like, uh, uh, here we are in COVID, what Johnny just said, being a fighter. I went in and I was with the president. I think it was around March 11th or the 13th. It was just as briefing right before we went into going into that 15 days. And his number one concern was the churches. He said, we need to make them essential. We need to, he said, I know that he was talking about the heaviness that we were about to go through in this first 15 days, before we had some of the information that we have now, before we knew what all we were facing, et cetera. He was so concerned about the churches. He, on his leadership, immediately called a day of proclamation. That was March 15th, a day that we would have repentance, we would pray, we would fast, that we would, and it wasn't just for that day, it would be through out the entire COVID. Think about the PPP. Any other administration never thought about putting the church at the forefront. So here he puts a church at the forefront. Of course, SBA did 14 uh, years of loans in 14 days. They made sure that small businesses were taken care of. But what did they do? The president wanted to make sure that churches and houses of worship were uh, legally protected, knowing that they pay payroll taxes, knowing that uh, they have all the same situations, property taxes at times, different situations. They know that they have certain things and he wanted to make sure that they were right there. We can look at how he established the center at the White House. The, the faith office prior was over at HHS. He says, I want it back at the White House. So he established the Center for Faith Opportunity Initiative that every single department has a faith director. Not only do they have sometimes multiple faith directors, but he said every agency has to have someone that represents faith. Then he assigned a position that would oversee that, that would answer to him and also to Attorney General Barr to protect religious freedom. This was the forefront. There were eight primary things that he did from strengthening family, alleviating poverty, prison reform. I mean, we can continue to go on, like Johnny said, not just what he did to go after what we call the bad actors, the bad guys, but look what he's done for Israel. Look how promise made, promise kept, how he campaigned, made sure that he recognized uh, Jerusalem as the capital, that he moved the embassy, what he's done on, what he's doing even up to now. So our present for religious liberties has been so Every department before, there were restrictions. I, we always say he's the president of deregulation. So if it took, you know, eight steps to build a building or, or a bridge or something, it probably now takes two steps. But he did this within the community of faith. You see, for so long, we've been on the defense. I mean, you're looking at uh, sermons being subpoenaed in Houston. You're looking at Hobby Lobby being fined up to a million dollars a day because of their Christian beliefs and value. You're looking at a former administration that went after the little sisters of the poor. Those girls, those nuns are fighters, though. They would not give up. And, and what we're saying is that the, the, the faith community including myself, we came against pornography so hard, went under an investigation and th things that we believe in, that we believe are sacred to our faith. We were on the defense. We were sitting here saying, and now all of a sudden, it started out simple by him saying, we're going to put Mary back in Christmas. But that got enough of the message out that said, hey, maybe this guy really is going to stand up and fight for the church, boy, has he exceeded all the expectations. I could continue to go on. He did prayer guidance in schools. People feel, and they know they can pray in school, not be shut down. Talk about coaches that got fired for praying. No, he was saying, we. He when he realized that 
if you were serving soup, that there were former administrations that said, or if you were doing counseling, you had to first refer out to a secular organization before you could pray if somebody asked for prayer. He said, if you're serving soup and somebody wants prayer, pray for them. So, I mean, he just continued to chase down the policy that had been put on that restricted so much within the faith community. Was everything enforced? In some states it was, some it wasn't. But I can tell you what, this president has taken it off. You look at the grants that, that for the first time it started, it seems small, but he said, hey, if there's a disaster, why should houses of worship who are the frontline responders and know community people better than ever. Why should they not be at the very front? So they should be eligible and have access to FEMA money if there's a disaster. Well, he did that across the board with every single department. So instead of saying you're faith-based and you cannot have any or be a participant or apply for these grants, what he did was make sure that there was access to all capital access to everything that people of faith were not denied because he realizes that people of faith look at our farmers to family what he just did he carved out three billion dollars for the cares package so not only did that help our farmers that food was going to waste but he realized that no child no adult should ever go to bed hungry that they should not have to choose whether they're going to have to uh, starve or to pay for their lunch during this difficult time. So we rallied and called together the faith-based, unprecedented a faith coalition was formed. It included people like World Vision, City Serve, um, Rescue Mission, Convoy of Hope, I mean, Mercy Chef, all these others. They're not getting paid a dime. They were formed together. So the farmers then had suppliers. These suppliers, which became grantees, helped save the businesses. The businesses work to get that last mile through the houses of worship, which are 384,000 houses of worship. They've gotten them food to people, 20 million boxes just through uh, so far. I think it's a, a little above that. 20 million boxes, and, and we're talking SNAP. We're talking like the most nutritious. And that was a phone call our president made to Secretary Sonny Perdue that said, listen, we've got to help our farmers. We've got to help our businesses. We work through the faith community and we've got to get food to the most distressed, vulnerable, food insecure communities. I can go on and on and on in practical ways how he says it's so important. Johnny, what about the day, yeah. uh, the National Day of Prayer? You know? No, I, and, I, 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 I I want to. I want to. Punk, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Pastor Paula, but you you know so much about all of this, and there was one thing that you said just in passing. I want to really make sure people heard you say this. Things got so bad when it comes to religious freedom that if you were at a soup kitchen yep. and you wanted to pray for somebody, in addition to giving them food, that was not acceptable to the federal government. You could not pray to someone. You you could be a church. Your whole community could be decimated by a hurricane, and you weren't allowed to receive federal funds. That's what that that is the policy of the Democratic Party. This is the way they they interpret separation of church and state. This is how they do it, you know. And this is what's crazy. Like, you know, the, these our founding fathers who were forgetting, you know, as statues get torn down all across the country, you know, it, they they came and established this country not not to not to not to like take the religion out of the country. You know, in fact, the famous letter for the separation of church and state by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists, I mean, that letter, they wrote him because they were concerned about the government encroaching on them. And he writes them a letter and he says, you don't have to worry about the government getting in your business because here we have the separation of church and state. It's the exact opposite. And, and we just saw it again in COVID, right? What did they say? They said, you know what? Thanks, thanks for obeying, guys. Thanks for shutting down and doing the right thing. Now, we just want you to stay that way a little bit longer and we'll tell you when it's okay to worship again while thousands of people gathered on the street it's unbe it's unbelievable that's how bad things got and it will get there again believe me if we don't if we don't keep let, 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 let me let me yeah, do a mariano rivera that, that was i think what looked good back then compared to what we are facing ahead of us because i know you're living this so let me do a mariano rivera here and close this subject of religious liberty real quick Religious liberty is the firewall, the quintessential firewall against secular totalitarianism, mm -hmm. religious liberty. We went from the IRS being armed yeah. to persecute That's right. Christian groups. 
Yep. To the to under under our current president, to auditing every single governmental agency to protect the religious liberty yep. of every right. single American. I mean, juxtapose this. We went from the IRS coming after us right. to making sure every governmental agency protects our religious liberty. Elections have consequences. If you see yourself primarily as a Democrat or Republican, black, white, yellow, or brown, then you're going to vote accordingly. If you see yourself as a Christian, Amen. first and foremost, or a person of faith, then you're going to vote to protect religious liberty, not just for you, but for your children and your children's children. It's great. Yeah, I mean, and it's, um, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, sorry, I, sorry. So you're, much, you're getting me fired Joe, up. This is, I, you know, I, so I get, the, the president's record as being a staunch defender of religious liberty speaks for itself. There's so much good news to share. It's an incumbent upon us, all of us, to share it with our friends and family as we head into what's 128 days from this Saturday, November 3rd. So important. Um, let's take one final break and we'll be right back for more with Faith in America, Evangelicals for Trump. During the coronavirus pandemic, Joe Biden criticized President Trump's China travel ban. Hysterical xenophobia. He was dead wrong. For 40 years, Biden's been wrong on China, supporting trade deals that destroy American jobs, giving China most favored nation status, letting China walk all over us. The beautiful history we wrote together. But Biden has never been more wrong than now. Hysterical Joe xenophobia. Biden in the White House would be a deadly mistake. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Thanks for joining everyone, Evangelicals for Trump tonight on Faith in America. For the final section, I just want to go around and ask all of our great guests tonight why November 3rd has so much on the line for the faith community in America, particularly for evangelicals, but anyone of faith in America. Pastor White, why are you voting for this president in November and why is it so important to you in faith? Well, there are so many reasons. As Johnny said, I have two grandchildren. Um, this is about generations. This is about what is going to happen, not just again these next four years, but these next 30 years. The Supreme Court justices are huge. We just put in, President Trump just put in our 200th uh, judge on the lower courts. We have changed 40%, 40 percent of that landscape. There has to be four more years. Then we begin to look at things like what he's done with opportunity zones. By creating that with just a stroke of the pen, when you look at what he did with tax cuts and job acts, he created a vehicle for private wealth to go into the most distressed vulnerable community that were chosen by governors in their states, over 8,000 of them, closer to almost 9,000, over 8,000 of those right now at over $100 billion lifting up, giving job opportunity. We see that over and over. We also see historical black colleges. You hear him as he talks about how every year people would come back. And I've had the great pleasure of being um, around there and in this and seeing so much and, and, and come back and ask for money. And he's like, why are you back again? I love having you back, but why? Well, we had to. Well, you don't have to anymore. So for 10 years, the most money ever for historical black colleges, we can continue to look at the rights, mental health care, the prevents, how what he's done for our veterans, for the suicide, the opioid crisis, how he continues to care about those that are truly the most vulnerable. I've been in the meetings with prison reform. It started at a small dinner that all of us were at. In fact, Sammy and Johnny were sitting at a table with Jared. And Sammy, I think, said, hey, you know, if every 
church could adopt a prisoner, we would drastically lower the recidivism rate. I get a call the next day and say, Paul, is that true? Do churches make that big of a difference? I said, absolutely. So we started giving evidence based. Look what we pushed over the line. Look at what happened. And you know why? Because this president doesn't talk about it. He is a solutions president. We've talked about the religious liberty. The contrast is so different. Do you want to have freedom? Do you want to worship? Do you want to have school choice? If anyone, look at our economy. Even in COVID, we had jobs up the second month in May. We had retail sales of 17%. I think we'll have another good jobs report prior to COVID. Highest unemployment rate. He understands the importance of getting distressed communities the capital that they need, the access to education, the access to equity and funding. He understands the problem with home ownership. He understands the African-American black people on 41% to 70%. He understands how to empower community. We're looking at a trillion dollars into infrastructure, rebuilding our communities entirely. So where do you wanna live? I mean, do you wanna live in what you're seeing? Do you want to live in complete anarchy, no control, complete chaos? Do you want to live with no freedom to worship? Do you want to live? I mean, let's start talking about pro-life. Let, let's look at what he's done. Not only been the first sitting president, president to show up for March for Life, immediately he signed a city of Mexico, Mexico City policy. Well, you say that and people don't really know. What he just did was take our tax paying dollars and defunded nine billion taxpayer dollars that were paying for foreign abortions. We can look what he's done here with Title X. Right now, the exact opposite. Joe Biden, a Catholic who was pro-life, is now being funded by Planned Parenthood. I mean, the world is upside down. This is not for a believer that is following the word of God. This is, as Sammy said, as a Christian, which has to be our first priority. This is not even a choice. Now, maybe someone says, well, he just makes this statement. He's brash, he's that. First off, if they really understood how much we were fighting uh, with our hands behind our back, it truly is fake news. Neither side can be trusted in media, social media, anything. The most, the best way to get information out, and information brings transformation, is that everyone get the information themselves and share it with your friends. You've got to talk. You've got to let people know. Go sign up at Evangelicals for Trump. Let us at least get the talking points. Fact check it. Find it out. Get information. Because if not, I'm afraid of the world that you will live in and look back. It reminds me of Israel um, when they were theocracy saying, we, we want a king. We want a king. God's going, no, you don't. No, you don't. We do. We do. No, you don't. No, you don't. We do. We do. I think that you might get something that you found, find out you don't want what you got because behind Biden is a machinery that is very dangerous, very progressive, very, when we say liberal, not center, but we're looking at going to a place that, like Dr. Ben Carson said, we're looking at real enemies to America, which are socialism and Marxism. I want him to get into all the deals he made, how he brought back economy um, from the Mexico-Canada agreement, what he did with NAFTA, what he did with China, how he economically empowered. Why vote for this president? Because your life is going to be freer, your family is going to be freer, your faith is going to be freer, and you are going to be more prosperous. Amen. Johnny or, or, or go ahead, Pastor go ahead, Rodriguez. Look, I mean, it's, it's a matter of what you care about. I mean, if, if you say you're pro-life, like politics aside, like Donald Trump has the best pro-life record of, of any president. He has done more, including every preceding uh, American president. Like you, you say you, you, you support um, religious freedom, right? He's done more th than any preceding American president. You, you care about uh, foreign policy. It, you know, the, the Obama-Biden administration you, you, of course, remember why Obama picked Biden, right? All those many, many years ago. It was kind of a different Joe Biden back then, but he picked him because he was allegedly 
you know, more prepared for foreign policy. This is one of Obama's weaknesses. He didn't know much about foreign policy. So he picked Joe Biden, who was like on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And we watched the single worst American foreign policy in a period of time. We gave the world to China. We watched a, a, a caliphate in the Middle East, a caliphate, not, not like a war. I mean, we ended up with this medieval caliphate in the Middle East. We, we had people marking Christian homes, selling children as slaves. You know, I, I remember probably you do too, like watching on TV as, as Kobani was being attacked, like, you know, day after day after day, 10 days and 10 days and 10 days, all these bombs falling into Kobani. The United States of America looked like we, we had no capability of doing it. So in fact, in my, in my book, Defying ISIS, which I wrote back then, I, I documented the, the, the many circumstances where, for instance, the United States government refused to take out the vehicles that were being used by ISIS to transport oil, to sell that oil in order to fund their jihad because of environmental concerns, because of environmental concerns. So we wouldn't take out the vehicles because we were so concerned about the environment when people, including children, yeah. nine-year-old little girls being sold as slaves. The United States could have done something about that, but we chose not to do something about that. We gave Iraq to Iran. I mean, we, we did all of these. You care about foreign policy. Like, you know, Donald Trump has made America stronger. He's boosted our military. You know, I, I, I used to say about, about uh, Biden uh, and, and Obama, you know, whether they like it or not, you know, the United States is still the most wealthy and prosperous and powerful country in the world. And that's, that's what we were. But they seemed ashamed of it. Donald Trump is not ashamed of it. And I'm not ashamed of it. And this is the other thing I'd say, like, you know, you have no reason to be ashamed of Jesus Christ if you're a Christian. Make no reason to be ashamed of your faith. And let me tell you, you have no reason to be ashamed of this president. He has fulfilled every promise he has made. And, and he is, his policies have been righteous policies. They protected sure. the unborn, the great human rights issue in our world. They've made the world a safer place. They've stood up to terrorists. They've, you know, he took out the, 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 the worst extremists in, in the entire world, Soleimani. He took out the... the the caliph, you know, of ISIS, who who had kidnapped a little American, a, a, a teenage American girl, you know, she was a college student at the time, uh, fr from Arizona, who was a Christian who went to serve people uh, in, in the region. Like, I, I'm sorry, but the list just goes on and on and on. Like, you care about justice issues? I yeah. care about justice issues a lot. The, the president corrected, corrected, the, right. the bill sponsored by Biden like 30 years ago, which created mass incarceration in the United States of America. In the last in the last 30 days, 45 days, people have been concerned about what's what's been happening uh, in, in, at the death of, of George Floyd. They asked the president to do things. The murder of George Floyd, I, I, I might say. What did the president do? He met with victims. He signed uh, the survivors of victims. He, he, he signed an executive order. He did exactly everything they asked him to do. Right now, Congress hasn't done any of that stuff. They could have done it earlier this week, but they didn't because, because they wouldn't allow a Republican to get credit for it. I mean, this is all absurd stuff. You care about religious freedom? Easy choice. You care about pro-life issues? Easy choice. You care about a strong America? You care, it just goes on prosperity for our children, the American dream, all of these things. Mm -hmm. Like you care about this is just has nothing to do with politics. The facts alone say the only way to keep America great is, is, is just to reelect Donald Trump. And then, by the way, let me just tell you, I, I promise I'll be quiet after this, guys. But let me just tell you, we have to do this because 200 judges is a historic record. Unbelievable. This president has done something no one else has done. It's also not the touchdown. We're on the one yard line. We're on the one yard line and we can't get the ball over uh, without without another term. We have more work to do. We're on the one yard line. This election for me is not about me. It's about my seven, five and three year old children. Like I got to give them an America. And if we can get this done, like we're going to give it to them. So everybody's got two jobs between now and then. Like one job, one job is to do everything you can to register more people to vote. And the other job is the fact of the matter is that too many evangelical Christians are still not showing up at the polls. They're just not doing it. And so we got to get people out of November. It was the record last time. It'll be the record this time. But but we got to do even more than we've ever done before. And all of us need to say the next four months, I got a second job. So that, that's that's all that's on my mind. Sorry, guys. Sammy, sorry. So no good. hype, no hype, no rhetoric, no hyperbole, without a doubt. This is the most important election 
in my lifetime. Yeah. Period. Bar none. If you if you are driven by life, religious liberty, and biblical justice, you will vote one way. If you believe in defunding the police but funding Planned Parenthood, you yeah. will vote the other way. Sure. Simple. If you believe that government is God, that Uncle Sam is not just your uncle, but he is your God, sure. you're going to vote one way. But if you believe that Uncle Sam is just an uncle, but he will never be our Heavenly Father, that's right. you're going to vote another way. It is about life, religious liberty, and biblical justice. If you really want to see the nation come together and all the racial tension be addressed in a way for you and I that is biblically substantiated and truly reflects the initial values, the principles that drove our founding fathers to write the Bill of Rights, then you're going to vote one way. But if you believe in feeding the engine of continuous discord and strife, of perpetual segregation of silos based on color and social economic background, you're going to vote another way. Simply stated, there is a stark contrast this election that arguably we've never seen before. This is not 2008. This right. is not when the Democratic Party would say abortion should be legal, they should be rare, and they should be in the first trimester. If you right. believe in ninth month, forget about ninth month, even post-birth abortion. If you believe in infanticide, oh, Pastor Sam, that's hype. We don't believe in that. It's the policy of the Democratic Party for crying out loud. I didn't write the platform. Do your due diligence. This is not the party that actually had an abortion reduction task force in 2008 for a few months. Then, of course, it collapsed. It's not that party anymore. The Democratic Party has left the reservation of common sense. And it is right now has great issues with faith. If you're a Christian, I'm a Christian first and foremost. And in full disclosure, I'm an independent. I'm a pro-life, pro-religious liberty, biblical justice, independent American, a Christian American of Latino descent. And I don't drink the Kool-Aid. But listen, the, the donkey left the reservation. And how in the world do they want people of color to vote for a party that is anti their faith? So if your Christianity is the most important thing in your life, dare ye not press the lever for a party that is anti your faith, your pro-life agenda, your pro-religious liberty agenda, and your agenda of biblical justice that will fulfill the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. It's totally up to you. And don't tell me it's just politics. Policies matter. That's and if right. you have an issue with the personality Look at the policies. That's right. Look at the policies. For crying out loud, by your fruit you shall be known. Look at your look at the policies, like Johnny and, and Pastor Paula have both stated so eloquently. It's about my children and my children's children. Silence is not an option. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. We are what we tolerate, and there is no such animal as comfortable Christianity. This November, vote life, religious liberty vote biblical justice in the name of Jesus. Let's change America. Let's go change the world. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us. Faith, family, freedom. It's all on the ballot this November. And if you want to get involved to help reelect President Trump, please text STAN to 88022. Download the Trump app. Let's all stay connected, stay safe. And until then, God bless you and your family. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Take care.